Ladies and gentlemen, let me all uh, welcome you here at this uh, official inaugural lecture by Dr. Koser, who is appointed, has been appointed as extraordinary professor in conflict, peace, and security in the Faculty of Humanities and Sciences at the Maastricht Graduate School of Governance, and who will accept this position with the delivery of his inaugural lecture. And the title of his lecture is When is Migration a Security Issue? Dr. Koser. Well, Professor Suter, thank you for that very kind introduction. Esteemed professors, colleagues, friends, it is an honor and a privilege to be appointed as an extraordinary professor in conflict, peace, and security today. I fear there is nothing at all extraordinary about me, but there certainly is about you and about the institution that you represent. Where better to give an inaugural lecture on migration than in one of the most international universities in the world? I remember being humbled when I submitted my doctoral thesis, too many years ago now for me to admit when, alongside doctoral students from other disciplines, working on far more important topics than mine. How could refugee decision-making possibly compare with cancer research or new sources of renewable energy? I am similarly humbled to be standing at the same lectern this afternoon, where in recent weeks and months, professors have lectured on critical issues like adoption, like the importance of the family. I was particularly sorry not to be here to see my friend and colleague, Hein de Haas, Professor Hein de Haas, deliver his inaugural lecture on migration myths. I strongly recommend to anybody else who missed that lecture to follow it on YouTube. Hein is the most original thinker in migration for at least the last two decades, and you are very lucky to have him as one of yours, as one of ours. This evening is the pinnacle of my modest academic career. I've taken a rather winding route to this zenith. I was an undergraduate at the University of Cambridge, a PhD student at University College London, I've held academic positions at the Universities of Utrecht here in the Netherlands, Sussex, University College London, SOAS, Georgetown University, and the Graduate Institute in Geneva. My career has not just taken me between universities and between countries, but also between sectors. I've worked for universities, I've worked for governments, I've worked for the United Nations, and I've worked for think tanks. My current challenge is to establish a new global fund on countering violent extremism. In this sense, I think that I have found the right home here at Maastricht University. A university that stands for academic rigor and excellence, but also understands the importance of policy relevance. A university that promotes and rewards interdisciplinarity. A university that has the vision to create partnerships with the private sector and international organizations. My position here has given me the opportunity to continue trying to bridge the gap between research and policy. And that's something I've striven to do since I began my prof professional career. But my position has also allowed me to try to bridge my two main academic interests. On the one hand, migration, and on the other hand, security. And it's this relationship between migration and security that I would like to address this afternoon. Esteemed professors, colleagues, friends. In the 25 years since I started working in this field, I have witnessed a sea change in our understanding of the relationship between migration and security. The focus has shifted fundamentally from a focus on human security to a focus on national security. I wrote my PhD on the repatriation of Mozambican refugees from Malawi during the 1990s, the so-called decade of repatriation. My postdoctoral research focused on the Bosnian, then the Kosovar exodus, 
when millions of refugees were admitted and mainly resettled in European countries. This was the decade when the UN Migrant Workers' Convention was launched and when asylum seeker numbers peaked in Europe but without panic. Of course there were aberrations, but by and large I would argue that when I started my career there was international consensus that the rights of migrants and refugees should be upheld and their human security prioritised. Today, I would argue, the security lens on migration has shifted from human security to national security. Sometimes rightly, usually wrongly, migrants, asylum seekers and even refugees are increasingly viewed as opposing a threat to national security. The very states that carried the Refugee Convention into force are today abrogating their responsibilities. The Migrant Workers' Convention only entered into force in 2003 and has staggered on ever since with no real global traction. Small numbers of irregular migrants generate political and pu public responses that are way, way out of proportion. Migrants have come to be associated with extremism, crime and disease. How has this happened? Why does it matter? And what can be done? Esteemed professors, colleagues, friends, what has happened in the last 25 years that migrants are now viewed as a cause of insecurity and not a symptom of insecurity, as a threat and not an opportunity? I think there are at least five explanations. One, of course, is that the number of migrants worldwide has increased significantly, perhaps even doubled, over the last 25 years since I've been working in this field. Today, there is an estimated 234 million migrants in the world, and that is roughly the population of Indonesia, the fourth most populous nation on Earth. But let us also note that statistics in migration are all too often used to alarm rather than to inform. 234 million people represents, after all, only 3% of the world's population. And this proportion has remained more or less static since the world's population has begun to grow more quickly. Perhaps a more important truth is captured in the title of Stephen Castle's and Mark Miller's seminal book on migration, The Age of Migration. The point here is that it is not just the 234 million migrants who count, but also the billions more who are affected by migration. It is probably not too much of a stretch to suggest that there is nobody left on Earth today who is not affected by migration, if not directly, then indirectly. If you are not a migrant or the descendant of a migrant, then certainly you have neighbours who are, or there are migrants at your children's school. Your favourite soccer team has a striker from another country. Your favourite food, music, art, literature is infused with migration. Among the elite, the multicultural, the transnational, the liberal, the educated, the employed, this may be cause for celebration. For many others, it is a cause for uncertainty and for fear. This fear and uncertainty is only compounded for many by the diversity of migration. Even 25 years ago in Europe, migration was largely from a predictable and familiar set of countries former colonies with which there were strong social, economic and cultural exchanges, where many spoke the language of the former colonial power and had followed the same education system. Today, in contrast, we live in an age of hyper-diversity, with an astonishing array of migrants from new countries overlapping these more familiar migrants. Think about Afghanistan, Eritrea, Somalia, Syria. And there is something here that even makes liberals worried. 25 years ago, a school teacher in London or Amsterdam was confronted with a mixed class, perhaps 70% nationals and 30% from one or two other countries. Of course, this was a challenge. Part of the class perhaps did not speak the native language as their mother tongue, followed different customs, had different understandings, but it was manageable. Today, that same classroom has changed out of recognition. There are perhaps 50% nationals, and among the remaining 50%, an increasing diversity of languages, customs, and understandings, with new students arriving and leaving all the time. Don't be surprised that English and Dutch parents 
are taking their children out of these classes and out of these schools for fear that standards are slipping as teachers find it hard to keep up with these changes. We may celebrate hyperdiversity in the abstract, but on the front line, it is very hard to manage. Another aspect of migration that I think has magnified concerns is the growth, of course, of irregular migration. Now, irregular migration itself is a complex concept. It includes people who enter without authorization, but also those who stay illegally having, entered, having entered legally or breached their visas. It combines people who deliberately cheat with those who are duped or just too challenged to understand what they have to do. It includes perpetrators, it also includes victims. Of course, these nuances are largely lost on the public, who simply see people cheating the system, jumping the queue, taking advantage of the welfare state. And of course, in part, their concerns are reasonable. When I arrived in the United States a few years ago, I was a very strong proponent for the regularization of the many millions of irregular migrants uh, in that country. Of the many arguments against regularization that I heard, the most compelling was from a friend of Sri Lankan origin. He had spent years in the United States studying and working, and eventually he earned the right to become a US citizen. Why, he asked me, would you reward people who've cheated when I had to work hard to earn my passport? So surely, he would say, with rights come responsibilities. My friend is right, although I still can't see an alternative to regularization. Certainly, deportation is inconceivable for all sorts of reasons, and I don't accept that a policy of benign neglect is sustainable or credible as a long-term solution to irregular migration in the United States. But if my friend is right, many others are wrong about irregular migrants. Their numbers are relatively small. Their impact on the welfare state is negligible. Their economic impact is almost always positive. They tend not to compete with locals for jobs because they're doing the work that we are unwilling to do. Most obey the law when they are allowed to and break the law only when they have no alternative. And herein, I think, lies a fourth reason why we are increasingly scared of migration. It's because we don't understand it. And I'm not here referring to the complexities of migration theory or the complexities of migration decision making nor to any supposed clash of cultures. I'm referring to a yawning and growing chasm between public perceptions of migration and its realities. To read the press, to listen to politicians, to speak to many otherwise sensible people, you would believe that we are being engulfed by a tidal wave of migrants, that government has lost control, that the fabric of our societies is being shredded. Of course, some countries face extraordinary pressures, but these are not countries in the European Union. Last year, South Africa alone received more asylum applications than the entire European Union combined. Of course, there are localised challenges, the Bauma in Amsterdam, the Banlieu of Paris. But on the very substantial whole, migration is well managed, benefits national economies and contributes to social and cultural diversity. I cannot think of another area where perceptions are so out of touch with reality. And later I'll come back to what we might do about this. A final reason for the securitization of migration is of course that since the terrible events of 9-11, almost everything has become a security risk. Climate change security, demographic security, food security, energy security, water security, why leave migration out? Well, Actually, there are very good reasons to leave migration out, to which I'll now turn. Esteemed professors, colleagues, friends, the implications of viewing migration as a threat to security are many and are profound. One is that we risk blaming the victims. Let's be honest, migrants already have a hard enough time without also having to shoulder the blame for national security. Some are fleeing for their lives. Others are moving to find a better future. Not many are moving for fun. If they are unlucky, they may take months or even years over their journey. They may risk exploitation, injury and death, and being stranded in transit countries. If they are lucky, they settle quickly and find work. 
but all too often work that is not commensurate with their skills and in the face of discrimination. They leave behind friends and family, they often experience loneliness and depression. Now, of course, this is a generalisation. Not all migrants are victims. But believe me, it is less of a generalisation than suggesting that all migrants are criminals or cheats or vectors for disease. A second risk of securitising migration is poor policy making. For years, we have been calling for joined up government on migration. It is an issue that touches upon so many aspects of governance, from the national to the regional to the urban to the local. From employment through health and education and housing and development to policing and border control and security. Yes, security. Security is an integral component of managing migration, but it is only one component. And yet, at the level of national governments, regional processes and global forums, migration increasingly has become centred on agencies and ministries concerned with security. Australia is a good example. The Department of Immigration and Citizenship has now been rebranded to the Department of Immigration and Border Protection, and a three-star general is now in charge of border protection. The same trend is also clear in Europe. To be sure, these are well-resourced ministries and departments and agencies, but they can't manage migration alone. And increasingly, their staff is becoming disillusioned to be part of a project that they didn't sign up for and they no longer believe in. Migration may be one of the most difficult issues of all to manage and control, and we are undermining any chance of getting it right by narrowing our policy focus and undermining those who are devoted to getting it right. Bad policy in turn results in bad migration. The evidence is clear. The immediate implication, for example, of building the fence between Mexico and the United States was that there were more and not less irregular Mexicans in the United States. Whereas in the past they would commute across the border in response to seasonal opportunities for work, now they don't risk going home because they know it'll be too hard to get back into the country. Similarly restrictive migration policies risk similar unintended consequences. More migrants now come to Europe illegally because they cannot come here legally. The migrant smuggling and human trafficking businesses are booming. Again, these policies are justified, but again, they can only be one component of a wider approach. But the third risk I'd like to turn to is where viewing migration as a security issue yields responses that I do not consider to be justified. Perhaps my main concern about securitizing migration is that we risk legitimizing extraordinary responses. Let's take a brief deviation. If I were to ask this group whether you feel that extraordinary responses, that trespass on norms, that trespass on rights, are legitimate in response to the threat of terrorism, I think we might have an interesting debate. Some of you would say absolutely not. Others of you might suggest that suspending the rights of the few may be justified to preserve the security of the many. It would be an interesting discussion. That's terrorism. But look what happens when we start to view migration as a threat to the security of the many. Certainly not extraordinary rendition, certainly not Guantanamo Bay, but detention centres in Papua New Guinea, turning back boats in the Mediterranean and elsewhere, deporting people to unsafe countries, detaining children, separating families. We should be outraged that these sorts of responses are occurring today in ours and many other rich countries. But we are not. And that, for me, is the most telling part. We have become normalised to the idea that migration is a threat. And we have become normalised to the responses that are being introduced to combat that threat. Against the bellwether of migration, we have lost perspective, we have lost purpose, and we have lost decency. We should all be ashamed. Esteemed professors, colleagues, friends, I may have overstated my case, but this is an inaugural lecture and I'm allowed some latitude and it's getting towards a, a sunny evening. You may not be convinced, but I hope that you at least recognise some of your own country and some of your own perspectives in what I'm speaking about when I suggest that increasingly migration is being viewed as a threat. 
I hope that you also appreciate the risks that this entails. Let me, for the third part of this presentation, turn to the really important question, and that is what can be done. And even if you don't agree with my thesis about security so far, this is a question worth asking about migration more generally. <clears throat> what can be done to bridge the gap between perceptions and realities? What can be done to calm down some of the hysteria? What can be done to confront extremist parties that are making political capital out of xenophobia, anti-Islam and anti-migration platforms? For many years, since I co-authored the final report of the Global Commission on International Migration, I've had a easy answer to that question. And that answer is political leadership, more responsible media and education. Let me share some anecdotes. And again, I think anecdotes are allowed after five o'clock, some anecdotes about the responses I've received over the last few years in response to those recommendations. Let's start with political leadership. I remember briefing a minister recently about migration and security. And I made to her much the same points that I'm making to you this evening. We need better evidence. We need to guard against generalizations. We need to beware of the consequences. She agreed. Well, she was a politician, so who actually knows whether she agreed, but she seemed to agree. But then she said to me, this is my problem. She said, I am part of a government and we are running for re-election and the election is next year. What would you recommend I do? I don't think I used this language, but I think in effect what I said to her was, continue to beat up migrants. Because I think we all know that in Europe today there is no surer way of winning votes than to attack migrants and migration. I lament the lack of political leadership on migration and so many other issues around the world today, but I am not naive. Politicians are trapped in short-term democratic cycles, are increasingly following rather than setting the agenda, and tend to put career prospects before principles. Frankly, I would probably do the same. So strike political leadership. What about the media? I remember being part of a panel on migration broadcast live in the UK, chaired by a BBC journalist. As is so often the case, and I want to return to this point in a few minutes, the debate quickly became polarised, with me arguing largely in favour of migration and the other panellists arguing largely against migration. He won the debate hands down. I don't think he won the debate just because he was a better debater than me, which he certainly was. But he also won the debate because his case was far easier to make than mine. He was making a case that many people now take for granted. I was trying to change their minds. He was reassuring. I was challenging. He had the evidence. We know how many migrants are in prison or are deported but firm evidence that migration benefits economies is still hard to come by. He was arguing facts, crime statistics, unemployment rates. I was arguing concepts, diversity, multiculturalism, innovation. I think out of sympathy, at the end of the debate, the chairman kindly gave me the last word, and he asked me what I would do to address some of the misperceptions that I'd been speaking about during the debate. I trotted out political leadership, education and a more responsible media. He, the chairman, a BBC journalist on live TV, put his arm around me and said you'll have to wait a long time for the last one. So strike the media. And I think it's time that also counts against the education argument as well. This is a long-term process. We need to educate, not indoctrinate, educate our public. We also need to educate migrants. And let me just say that again. We also need to educate migrants. Because integration is a two-way street. The failure to understand migration is as much a problem for and the fault of migrants as it is nationals. It's interesting to think about who we need to educate. The old tend to be more conservative than the youth, but they are more set in their ways and they're harder to educate and they have a growing political clout as their numbers start to outweigh the young in this ageing continent of ours. Analysis of the recent Swiss referendum against immigration showed clearly that those who lived in cities where migration is normal did not have a problem. 
It was those who did not have everyday contact with migrants and migration who did. Perceptions are stronger than realities. So while I think I would still insist on the importance of political leadership, a responsible media and education, I recognise the challenges. So let me instead suggest three other responses. One is to focus on the right issues, to disentangle the myths in Professor de Haas's terms from the realities. The threats posed by migration and by migrants are not terrorism or disease or crime. Of course, some migrants and their descendants have perpetrated terrorist outrages. Of course, some may import viruses and of course, some commit crimes. But there is no evidence whatsoever anywhere that migrants are more likely than nationals to be terrorists, to be sick or to be criminals. And where they are, often there are reasons that may at least to them seem rational. There is no such thing as a migrant mentality. And if there were, it would be better portrayed as courageous rather than criminal, as resourceful rather than resentful. I think we're focusing on the wrong issues when we speak about migration and security, which is distracting us from a sensible discussion about when and how migrants and migration actually can pose a threat. They can. Huge influxes of migrants and refugees can overwhelm services. They can damage the environment. They can challenge governance. Irregular migration on a large scale challenges the exercise of state sovereignty. Diversity, as we've seen, can be a challenge to manage. Migrants can become a lightning rod for resentment, which risks spilling over to settled ethnic minorities too. Another focus correction that I think is required is to think about migration and security in our origin countries and not just destination countries. Diasporas may be peace builders, but they may also be peace wreckers. The so-called brain drain depletes poor countries of skills, education, investment and moderation. The return and reintegration of large numbers of migrants and refugees is destabilising and may prompt conflict. If focus is important, so too is honesty. Political correctness or some other inhibition seems to have made it difficult to talk about migration and security honestly. Rewind to what I just said a paragraph ago. In essence, that in certain circumstances, migrants and migration may pose a challenge or threat to national interests and even national security. I know venues where this sentence alone would have me branded as right-wing, as anti-migrant, and even as racist. None of which is true, by the way, but even if it were true, it would be irrelevant. I am employing evidence carefully to make an informed and specific statement in the right context. For me, the migration debate has become too polarised. You tend to find people at either end of a spectrum. At one end, where migrants are victims who need to be protected or assisted, or an overwhelming force for positive change. At the other end, where they are all jumping the queue, competing for our jobs, or worse. Ladies and gentlemen, guess what? The truth lies somewhere in between these extremes. Some migrants are criminals, most are not. Some fill niche positions in the labour market, many are underemployed or unemployed. Migrant remittances lift entire communities out of poverty, but they also fund conflict. The space for an objective debate on migration is shrinking. And here, as I begin to draw to a close for this lecture, is where I turn my attention to you, to us to Maastricht University and to academia. For if we cannot promote objective debate, if we cannot cope with unpalatable truths, if we allow our personal politics to hijack our professional calling, then I think we are failing. As some of you know, I edit the Journal of Refugee Studies, and I confess that sometimes I despair of the trap that otherwise good and well-meaning academics consistently fall into. The most common narrative that emerges from submissions to the journal is that refugees are suffering and it's the fault of the United Nations or the international community, period. Unthinking, uncritical, uninspiring, unworthy of the calling. And now let me make my final point on responses. 
let me propose my final solution. And again, this is targeted on you, on us. And that is to urge you, to urge us, to celebrate the outrage, the naivety, the impatience of your students. Because that is exactly what we need to correct our course on migration. We need to demand, we need to expect, we need to not tolerate no for an answer. Esteemed professors, colleagues, friends, let me at last answer the question posed at the start of this lecture. When is migration a security issue? Migration is a security issue when the lives and dignity of migrants are at risk. Human security begets national security, which in turn begets global standards of decency. Migration is a security issue when, in exceptional circumstances, migrants pose a direct challenge to safety, economic stability, social cohesion and governance. Migration is a security issue when it becomes an excuse for extraordinary policies. Migration is a security issue when it suppresses the evidence, it suppresses objective debate, and it suppresses common sense. But most of all, migration is a security issue when we allow it to become one. We don't have to, and we shouldn't. Esteemed professors, colleagues, friends, it would be remiss of me not to conclude my lecture this evening without a few words of thanks. But don't worry, I understand that I'm receiving a professorship and not an Oscar, and so I'll keep these mercifully brief. The half-empty front row, of course, makes me regret that my family can't be here to, to share this important moment with me. I'm especially sorry that my parents can't be here. They both now have unfortunately passed away. My father was a refugee from India to Pakistan, and then a migrant to the UK. My mother was an English woman who converted to Islam and married a Pakistani during the 1960s in the UK. Not an easy thing, I suspect, to do. I would have been interested to see what they made of my lecture tonight. I think they'd have disagreed with most of it, but I think they'd still have been proud. I've learned an immense amount from students, from co-workers, from mentors through the year, and I look forward to continue to learning from them and working with them. Let me just mention a few, only a few by name. John Salt, Tony O'Connor, Ray Harris, Richard Black, Susan Martin, some of these names you may know. I've mentioned Professor Hein de Haas, whose scholarship I aspire to. Let me also mention Professor Ron Skeldon, whose sense of spirit I aspire to. It has been an honor to work with Ron and with Hein, and I very much look forward to continuing to work with them. Let us just hope that this evening Ron has seen some sense and not voted for Scottish independence. <laughs> I must, of course, also thank the migration team here at Maastricht. By far, in my opinion, the most dynamic, exciting bunch of researchers in this field in the world today. Uh, you have invited me to join your team. You have tolerated my unpredictability and unreliability, and I'm looking at Elaine directly as I say that, Elaine. Uh, and I must make a special word of thanks, of course, to Melissa Siegel and to Katie Cushminder. Finally, allow me to thank all of you for taking the time to be here this evening and for welcoming me to Maastricht University and to your family. It is an honour and a privilege to be appointed as an extraordinary professor in conflict, peace and security today. I fear there is nothing extraordinary about me, but there certainly is about you and the institution that you represent. Thank you. Professor Coulson, many thanks for these uh, very inspiring words and this, this great lecture. I think you came here to a university which is a university of migrants. I mean, I was reflecting while you were standing there 
and maybe a few Dutchmen are still here, a few guys here from the local environment, and even there I allow myself to go up pretty north. Uh, but for the rest we're dealing with Hungarian, German, Belgian migrants and of course this was always a migrant place so it's particularly fitting that actually we would start to do much more research on migration in this place and of course it's also a great place to be because we have here the dean of the faculty of law which is starting this new research group on item together with the people from the school of governance with the people from the faculty of arts and social sciences to build up expertise in migration and in that sense you talk broadening it to the much more greater issues dealing with human security and more generally national security raise some fundamental issues which i'm sure many of the people here you mentioned will be dealing with i think the the team which is building up here with you, with Hein de Haas, with Ron Skeldon, even if he might be tonight Scottish, okay. will be a great team in the sense of this diversity of approaches. And I think this is something which I'm particularly proud that, that this group is now starting to come really living, and thanks to your participation also in this group. You mentioned uh, some fascinating stories. I would love that um, you also will see that your favorite university is a university of migration and not just the traditional football teams. I think that with respect to many of the issues, um, the threat also in this country has been also many similar ideas you mentioned also within this country and this region, and that actually strengthens even the point of us here in the academic field to construct and to make migration much more understood for what it is and the various challenges you mentioned so clearly. I would like to invite all of you now for a reception in which you can congratulate our new professor here at Maastricht University. I would of course want to congratulate Professor Vosparen as the Director Dean of the School of Governance and of course the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Sciences, Professor Harm Hospice, who couldn't be here, as well of course as Professor, uh, professor Hildegard Schneider as the Director of the ITEM. Uh, item, sorry, the director of item, as well as the many other people who now, we have a, a really a very fascinating group here of migrant researchers. So on this, I close this session and I all invite you to reception. Thank you.